Kära vänner, välkomna hit idag på eftermiddagen för att eh, delta i riskkollegiets eh, prisceremoni eller prisutdelning. Eh, och eh, eftersom vår pristagare föredrar engelska så kommer vi att ha huvuddelen av det här på engelska. Eh, så, eh, eh, professor Van Rijk eh, Segal, eh, It's an honor to have you here. It's an honor to have the Swedish Risk Academy here, and uh, uh, from SSM as host, uh, we uh, are very grateful that we were able to support you with this. And uh, with these introductory words, I will turn to Sinuid to to continue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I think I need. To, uh, I switched to English, and I think I need. Uh, So, to, so you hear me because I know I speak a little bit soft. Now, uh, I also want to welcome you to this prize ceremony at uh, SSM. And of course, we are very grateful to SSM to be kind to host this ceremony, prize ceremony. Usually this takes place at the annual meeting of the Risk Academy or the Uh, Society for Risk Sciences, Risk Collegiate, but uh, this year it wasn't convenient because of traveling, so we are very grateful. Now, I, for you, those of you who don't, uh, don't know so much about uh, Risk Collegiate, I will just give a short introduction or presentation of what Risk Collegiate is and also about this uh, award, these awards that we have. Uh, Risk Kollegiet, or the Swedish Society for Risk Sciences, is a non-profit, non-governmental organization that was uh, established in 1988 by, the, I think, the Director General of SSI, Bo Lindell, uh, and, and also another a group of concerned scientists, and it was as a mini-academy. Now, the interest in risk, of course, increased over the years. And uh, since uh, 2000, year 2000, it was uh, open to uh, everyone interested in risk and who is supporting the aims of the academy to be a, me a member of the, the society. And the main objective of the society is to increase knowledge about risk in our society and also to how various risks are perceived, assessed and managed. And this is to support exchange of information and knowledge related to risk for an improved communication and understanding between uh, laymen scientists, experts, and decision makers. I don't know if we succeed there. Now, and this is done by arranging a symposia or more often seminars on various topics. And uh, previously we also released a newspaper or a pamphlet called Risknytt where all the news was presented, but these are now, that, that has stopped and we are now providing the information at the website. Recently we also started to discuss to, if we should explore the new media, social media, and to present or to have uh, 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 communication more with the public on various uh, topics uh, that is important for risk for understanding or for communicating. And of course, in the light of the Fukushima accident, I think that might be very important. The number of members in the society, however, has been relatively constant and is slightly just below 300, but the number of supporting organizations has increased during the years. And uh, now I come to this, uh, today that in order to, to stimulate and encourage and also to acknowledge persons who have influenced the field of risk or is supposed to have uh, 
important uh, to provide important contributions to this field. Uh, this colleague in uh, 2007 uh, founded two different types of awards. The Swedish Risk Academy Award for Senior Scientists and the Swedish Risk Academy Special Prize to Promising Junior Researchers. I think the title has slightly changed, but it's aimed at uh, uh, more PhD students in the beginning of uh, he or her car career. And this prize was uh, awarded last year. But this year it is the Senior, the, the senior Scientist Award. And in late autumn 2014, there was a request for nominations uh, for this prize and uh, the nominations were later uh, evaluated by our, our scientific council which is headed by the professor Margareta Törnqvist at Stockholm University. She was supposed to be here but uh, she got the flu yesterday so she is not there. And on their recommendation, the board decided uh, to nominate Professor Emeritus Valerai Scheral, or I think I pronounced it, <laughs> at the Royal Institute of Technology as this year's laureate. Professor Sega's main area of interest is severe accident safety for light water reactors. And I can tell you that his contributions in this field, I have it here, is enormous. But myself, I'm not an expert in safety. I'm in more in protection. So therefore I'm very grateful to Director Michael, Michael Knochenhauer at SSM who will give a survey and also point out the importance of Professor Sega's work for this award and also for nuclear safety. Please. Thank you very much. It will not be a uh, right. Welcome here and welcome everybody. I will not be very detailed in my, but I'll try to give you a little bit of. Uh, a little bit about the, the general importance of, of Rai's work and uh, uh, to Sweden in general, and uh, also to uh, what we do what we do here at, at SSM. So, um, with that background, I would say it's it's an honor and a pleasure for us. We are very happy to have received the question to host this event and uh, uh, to a person uh, awarding the uh, the. Uh, Risk Academy Award to a person with such a relevant uh, field of activity as uh, Professor Segal. Uh, I also, uh, looking at this event, I was a little bit, uh, I, personally, I, I was a little bit surprised to find, to, to okay, when, when did we meet? We haven't really met, we haven't worked together. We've been at several occasions at, at uh, the events uh, where we have been both, but uh, uh, we've never interacted professionally. However, I've heard your name and uh, with very positive connotations for about as long as I've been working in nuclear safety, which is, uh, even if I'm not at your very uh, it's an impressive age, I'm, it's becoming, it's, I'm, I'm accumulating quite a lot of, of years. It's more than 30 now. And uh, for the latest 10 years, I've been, uh, about 10 years ago, I started going into severe accidents a bit. And that's when you really started popping up um, the activities at KTH and the research initiated by you. And uh, okay, even if we haven't worked together, I checked you out on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, we are second connections and we have 181 connections in, uh, in common. So uh, we definitely move in the same circles. <laughs> um, you have a very wide international activity, even if you're well known in Sweden. And um, looking at, uh, don't go, not going into any details, but you've been, uh, among very many other things, you've been uh, acting as an invited uh, expert 
to review technical aspects of a lot of research programs, the US, Japan, Europe. Uh, you've served as a liaison officer for OECD and uh, you've coordinated a number of very large European Union research programs. So internationally you are well known. I know you share your time between Sweden, which is your base, but also you go a lot to the US, you go a lot to other countries. Uh, but I would say Sweden and your activities in Sweden are the most important to this forum and uh, the reason why, why we're sitting here today, I think. And, and your impact in Sweden has been considerable. You've collected a uh, group of young researchers in reactor safety at KTH and this generated a tremendous burst of creativity, a lot of activity. Um, I've heard that you are an excellent lecturer, very enthusiastic, uh, Yasmin, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get to that. Uh, share of that in a little while. I look very much forward to uh, to your uh, to your uh, talk. Um, the work you perform at KTH uh, covers a very wide range, and uh, just to name some export some examples, important examples, uh, your practical experiments about the uh, coolability of core melt uh, in the reactor pressure vessel and in the containment and also uh, your work related to uh, the nature of uh, in-vessel and ex-vessel explosions and the consequences. And quite a lot of work related to uh, uh, addressing various phenomena and uh, uh, their, say, whether or not they are resolved, unresolved, and you contributed to quite a lot to the resolution of, of, uh, of them. Um, I would say that your activities have uh, been important cornerstones of the way Sweden as a nation and uh, the industry, SSM, has addressed uh, issues related to severe accident management, both the activities and the physical systems uh, installed. I'd also like to mention the Nordic Research Project, a program on accident phenomena of risk importance, uh, usually known as APRI, it was initiated in 1992. It runs in a number of, I think it's three-year programs, and we're now just starting APRI 8. APRI has been an important uh, activity for us, so SSM R&D, uh, for SSM R&D, APRI has been an important activity and KDH has continuously contributed very widely and very importantly to the APRI program. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention when it comes to your importance to SSM is that uh, one of our key tasks as an authority is to support the building up and maintenance of national competence in the fields of nuclear safety and radiation protection. And uh, by your act activities, both the research activities and the more uh, un uh, basic tutoring at KTH, you've been an important uh, person in uh, bringing this along in Sweden. So in conclusion, you put KTH on the map as a world-leading center for research and knowledge generation in the field of severe accidents. This has been beneficial for Sweden. It has been beneficial for SSM, both in terms of providing us the knowledge, the science, to make our decisions, to contribute to build safety, to improve safety, but also justifying the decisions we have made. So. Uh, it's a great honor to us to have you here today to receive the Swedish Risk Academy Award 2015. Okay, Professor Van Rijsseral, we will honor you with this, this prize for the work you have done in nuclear safety. And the motivation for this, and I will take it in Swedish now, yeah. Professor Balraj Segal har under en lång forskarbana i USA och Sverige 
givet väsentliga bidrag till kunskap om reaktorssäkerhet och speciellt om svåra haverier i kärnkraftsreaktorer. Hans arbete har inriktats mot att förstå hur en olycka med en härdsmälta utvecklas samt hur reaktortank och inneslutning bryts igenom och leder till utsläpp av radioaktiva ämnen. Professor Sigals arbete har resulterat i världsledande beräkningsmodeller som används för analys och hantering av svåra reaktorhaverier. Hans insatser har fått stor betydelse för svensk forskning och svenskt internationellt samarbete inom reaktorsäkerhetsområdet. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I just want to say I'm really humbled by the award that you've given me. It's uh, it's an honor and and uh, a, a good one because uh, it's, it's appropriate to the profession I've been following for the last since the TMI2 accident. Really, I came up here in 1992, and that's when the Opry project started actually. Yeah, yeah. And um, so. It's a long association, and this is like a culmination of some of the, you know, work I've been doing that I get some award for it, which is which is <laughs> glad. Uh, yeah, very pleasure. Of it, yeah. We have also bought you some flowers. Oh, thank you. It's springtime, so yeah, it's springtime. something to look at also. You know, I can't <laughs> hold too many things. I will, I will yeah. put them back in the water. You know. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Then I leave the floor to you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Put this down here. What I'm going to talk about today is an event, Fukushima accidents, which really have changed the situation for nuclear power. Uh, the nuclear power, like even just before March 2011, was in a high sw swing position. It, it, everybody talked about a renaissance, and it really was happening. A lot of orders were coming, and then suddenly we got these accidents, which really have made a huge difference for the nuclear power industry and in general for the nuclear power situation in the world. So I'm going to address part of it. I'm not going to talk about political and economic. Well, I'll talk a little bit about economic issues, but not political. <clears throat> but we'll talk about the impact of Fukushima on LWR safety and the nuclear power risks. And this is a subject which I got associated with soon after Fukushima. Uh, I was on the American Nuclear Society uh, <coughs> Response uh, Committee, which uh, wrote what uh, U.S. response is about uh, the Fukushima accidents and what should be, what they described, we worked on uh, what the Fukushima accidents were, what they mean, and uh, how to respond to them from the from the American Nuclear Society point of view, and and so I was on that committee, and then also later another <coughs> association, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, they they also put together a committee to <coughs> respond to, and their their uh, response was actually a little broader in terms of uh, having societal response. To, to such accidents, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I was on that committee too. So in, in that sense, I've been with this for some time, and then uh, I went to Japan also for, uh, I gave some lectures there, and then the, the, we, we had a visit to the Fukushima uh, plant, and it's a sad affair there. It's, it's actually, uh, what I found was that they are burdened by this radioactive water which they have to dispose of continuously and, and 
it's, 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 a, it's a thing which really is a sad thing for uh, them to be just working on that for so long. It just is, is not a good thing. Yeah. So we'll go over this, uh, not the physical state in Fu of Fukushima at the moment so much, but uh, the impact of the Fukushima accidents. And so I will start uh, with the outline. There's the preamble as to what uh, is, was the situation before. Then I talk about the actual consequences of the actual severe accidents. We all sort of uh, project what could be the consequences of a hypothetical accident, but I look at what actually happened and what are the actual consequences, and then look at some of the lessons that were learned from these accidents. And so that accident, that's the impact of accidents on light water reactor safety. <coughs> then I have some views on the current safety practice and the shortcomings, and, and I think I want to tell you about my views on that. And 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 uh, finally, for the new bills, if if ever they come, uh, they are they are being done in certainly in China and and uh, some other countries. What should be the safety goals for commercial nuclear power? And then I have some conclusions, but then I looked at the whole situation here and I thought that Sweden has responded to some of these concerns already even before Fukushima. So I, I, I wanted to tell you about how Sweden actually is a, ahead of the game, ahead of the game in terms of because we are in this country more socially conscious than in some of the other countries. I think that's, that's true and I want to point it out to you and in, in a way to tell you that indeed Sweden is, is, has been more progressive than some of the other countries have been. And, and so I will tell about that too. After the conclusions which I had already put together for this talk. <clears throat> so we talk, want to talk about risks, you know, risks of a large scale develop, deployment of nuclear power. Because you know, one plant at the, in is only concerned about uh, local risk, but we are talking about large-scale de de uh, deployment. Just like in U.S., there were there are 110 plants, 108 plants. In European Union, there's 150 plants, and so this is quite a large-scale deployment of plants. And and uh, the concern came, which is quite a long time ago. Uh, about the, the 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 impact of that on the society, and and so this was what was done before 1975 was published in 1975. It was called Wash 1400, and they actually looked at two 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 types of plants: a PWR and a BWR, which were already installed in 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 uh, in US, and they did a very Detailed analysis, which in, which involved uh, faulty analysis for the failure of equipment and infrastructure, and then the inventory analysis for the accident scenarios to determine the probabilities of the occurrence of accidents. And then they did a physics calculation to look at the phenomenology of severe accidents and determine what the consequences could be. And, and it was very early, it was 1970s, the things were not developed, the phenomenology was not developed, but they achieved quite remarkable results, sound estimates actually. So in the next couple of tables, I show you the, the, <coughs> the conclusions. They said that the, the, so a severe accident probability it's like 1 in 20,000 reactor years. That's the kind of accident which is not very severe, which is, uh, if you see these columns here, early fatalities, early illnesses, property damage, decontamination area, and relocation area, 
these are very small, and this is a kind of accident which was like the TMI2 accident. Nothing much happened, and I, I'll come to that in, in the next few minutes. But then there's other higher uh, consequence events, accidents, but with lower probabilities, because that means you release radioactivity to the atmosphere, to the environment, and in, in that case, you have to have more failures in, in your accident scenario, and like the one in a million, one in ten million, and with each lower probability, you have higher consequences. But the, what the risk is, is a multiplication of, of the probability and the consequences. So, in, in that term, you can evaluate from here what are the risks for, for example, a, a relocation area of 130 square miles, miles, it's, this thing is in miles because that's US, and, and, um, and it's like the uh, 2.56 times uh, that will be the square kilometers. So these were the numbers which they generated, and they also generated numbers which were, which were latent cancer fatalities and, and uh, thyroid modules, which is the iodine deposit in the thyroid, and genetic effects. And in this you see that the latent cancer fatalities actually are uh, increasing quite a bit with, the, with these uh, less and less probable accidents, and, and then it is the normal incidence. The normal incidence of latent cancer fatalities, it, it, it normal incidence is much lower than possibilities in these accidents. But the other ones, like the thyroid modules and the genetic effects, the normal incidence is much higher. So these are not of great concern for these large accidents. But these are the estimates made at that time. And I think these estimates are reasonably good, but they have increased in time to larger numbers, somewhat larger numbers, but not, not by orders of magnitude. So uh, the first uh, accident, when you come back, this one, one in 20,000, is really of not great concern, and that's what the accident uh, category one, and this is uh, not that, but not that bad. But the category two accident, which is one in a million, uh, re requires a relocation area of 130 square miles, which is a radius of like 10 kilometers. So that was the kind of uh, uh, determination which gave that we should have a 10 kilometer exclusion area around around a plant. That was one of the factors which came in. And the third category of accidents in WASH 1400, that's probability of 1 in 10 million, which is, uh, uh, which is 10 to minus 7. There you start seeing uh, larger uh, consequences. And, and, uh, and if I would go in, in, in this uh, table and, and try to put accidents uh, along with this table, I would say the Fukushima accident is the category two, uh, and and the and the and the and the the Chernobyl accident would be like one in ten million, and according to this, of course, this um, early fatalities numbers here in the first column, like hundred ten and nine hundred, they are there if you do not evacuate, and 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 so we are doing this. Uh, with the accidents, there's a very fast evacuation of people from the affected area, so that really does decrease the early fatalities very much. So that's, that's you have to take that into account. So uh, this, these are the kind of consequences we have to deal with, with these accidents, and uh, that the figures, of, but the well, I have one criticism of the WASH 1400 that they have only uh, considered the figures of merit, which is which are which are the fatalities, injuries, and latent cancers. They did not think about the economic consequences that much. 
they have a number here for the property, total property damage, but they did not think about rehabilitation of people and did not think about the cleanup that one one is necessary to do if, if any area which is affected. So that the numbers which they quote for economic damage are much, much smaller than what actual economic damage can be of a of of a of a nuclear accident. So uh, this this is what the situation in 1975, and then we had the TMI two accident, which followed in in eight nine years. It was it was in 1979. Uh, it was 19, four years later. We had the TMI two accident. Now, we were lucky. I think we really we were lucky in this accident. The luck part is that the operators turned on the pumps which were cavitating and, and, and brought, uh, made the vessel full of water. And this, with that, we did not have a classic hypothetical accident we, which we generally calculate and there was water covered on top of this, off top of this uh, melt and, and that created this situation in which the melt, this is the melt which was cooled, this, but it, some, lot of the, lot of the melt was fragmented on top and did not contribute so much to the vessel attack as, as one would have if all of this melt here would be available for attack on the vessel. So only about 20 tons of the melt came down here and and it full, vessel was full of water, so we were able to cool it. You know, we were able to cool it. So this this accident, we had a lucky break, and so vessel did not break, and we didn't, we did not get the melt into the containment because that's when the big havoc starts because the containment is designed for certain certain uh, pressures and and thermal loads. And uh, well, the TMI containment was actually well designed, and and we had a hydrogen burn in there, which which we had had a pressure generation of two two bars, but the containment was designed to take that. They were designed for five bars, so we did not have that much of a um, consequence as as we would expect in a in a hypothetical accident. And this is the release from from the this is the reactor cooling system, and we got a lot of release. There, thirty percent iodine, fifty percent cesium came into the reactor cooling system. It came into the containment, and and then like uh, uh, still quite a lot of uh, release to the reactor building, but the containment did not s suffer any leakage and no, no, no damage. Some of it came into auxiliary building because the door was open for an hour, but the auxiliary building also did not have any, any, any damage. And so the total release to the environment was 5% of the noble gases and 10 to minus 6% of iodine. So very small amount of, of uh, release took place to the environment. And the contamination area was basically the reactor boundary uh, gates, and not to any 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 environment. And people were, of course, in panic, and they they went around, but they were they didn't need to, and so they came back soon. So home back soon. So that really was a good result for a pretty nasty accident because half of the core melted in this accident. The next accident happened in 1986. I just want to tell you that the, uh, you have to think of this too, that the, the probabilities of in, in this uh, chances per reactor year in the WASH 1400 estimates are 1 in 1 million. It means 400 reactors working. It would be like 200 years before an accident should happen. But it, it is, we have had this one, two, and three accidents in, 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 in quick succession, practically. 
So this was in 1979, and then the Chernobyl accident, which was a truly a seven, level seven accident with enormous radioactivity release, which spread over the eastern, eastern and northern Europe. It was first detected near Stockholm, 2,000 air kilometers away from Chernobyl site, which is, is shown here. Chernobyl is in the star there, and, and, uh, and we are there in Sweden, and that's where we detected it. And we didn't know at that time where the radioactivity is coming from, but we established that it's coming from the east, so there must be something wrong there. But the, the point is that this accident also demonstrated that radioactivity can spread over long distances. It is, it is uh, uh, all of our calculations showed that, that our radioactivity spread would be only a few, 10 kilometers, 15 or 40 kilometers, but this spread 2,000 kilometers away. And I'll show you later what was the amount of radioactivity that came to Sweden. <coughs> this is the result. It was an explosion. It was an explosion, and so you have a hole in that place. And even fuel was ejected out in, in during the accident, and it spread around the local area, of course. The, the but the but the high energy generated in this accident uh, led to this plume, which went up in the air and went long distances f uh, from the from the site itself. <coughs> now the the third set of accidents. These are three reactors in this case. Fukushima accidents, which happened in 2011. So from 1986, we had a respite of about 25 years or 35 years, and then we got this Fukushima accident, but there were three accidents altogether. And that happened from a natural um, event, uh, a big earthquake, a very large earthquake, leading to a giant tsunami, which, which uh, went over the embankment that the, that the plant had here, which was 10 meters high. Uh, and this the seawater level went up and came up here and went down. All the water inundated the buildings and, and the diesel generators were located in the, in the basement of this turbine building and they got all completely under water and they won't work anymore. So we had a long-term station blackout, which uh, uh, really is, is, is a accident which is not considered so much because station blackouts, the, the average time to put the station back into power is only about three to four hours. And, and that was the experience, but not for two, three weeks as it happened in this case. Uh, and, and in the Fukushima accident led to coal meltdown in units one to three, which were the operating reactors among the six. And, and what also happened that the hydrogen escaped from the containment into the buildings next door, which they were containing the uh, uh, containment, which were around the containment, and blew out the roofs and create a direct path to the environment. This hydrogen explosion also put the radioactivity a little bit high in the atmosphere, so it could go a little bit longer distance than, than it could without any, any uh, explosion. So uh, it, it spread. It spread uh, in, in directions, but it was lucky that most of the time of the accidents the winds were blowing towards the ocean, so that the fission product deposits were not as large as they could have been. It's also lucky that most of the radioactivity of the Unit 2 went into the water rather than up in the air. The Unit 2 did not have a had his roof blow out, and so Unit 1 and Unit 3 are the ones. And this is a, it's a containment bypass event because of these explosions, these hydrogen explosions. So uh, look at this Mark II, Mark I uh, reactor of General Electric, which was uh, which was the one 
uh, in this case, it's a small reactor. It's a small containment, but it, it, it this is this is what a 400 megawatt thermal a megawatt electric reactor uh, number one, uh, and number uh, three was I think 700 megawatts. But it's it's a smaller reactor, but the containment is so small, and then the containment is so constructed that this is one on top of the other. It's a construction like that, and the seals were old. And, and the pressure went up in the containment, and, and that's when the leakage took place from the containment into the outside building. And this is the outside building, and that's where the, this is where the hydrogen burnt and, and blew the roof off. So that's how this accident proceeded. And this is the, uh, some numbers which are in the measured, measured depositions in, in, in the environment. This is in a village called Litate, which is 40 kilometers far away from the uh, site. And, and, and this, is, this number here is the important one, which is cesium-137, because this lasts for 30 years, uh, half-life. And there are, this is so many becquerel per kilogram. So there, there's a lot of radioactivity release. And this number is on, on four days, eight days after the accident, March 11th, this is March 19th, and then this is in April. So still there's quite a lot of radioactivity still deposited in many areas. And there's some hot spots too. And, and, and uh, so this is a cleanup job, which I've seen that they're doing now. What they, what they are doing now is removing the topsoil and then digging, putting the topsoil at the bottom and bringing the bottom soil up and putting that up on, on top. And this is a really arduous, really detailed operation which takes a long time and also needs a lot of people because the, you can't expose the people to this radioactivity for a long time, so they rotate. So this is what's going on right now there. <clears throat> and this is the, the radioactivity in the water which came in because there was a lot of water, of course, generated. They tried to put water and then it would fill up and then come out from, the, from these vessels. And that was very radioactive. And this number two unit has uh, iodine here. Uh, this is at the water, that's the dose rate on the surface of the water, and it's more than 1,000 millisieverts per hour. And the, 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 the iodine level is like 1.3 times 10 to 7, the cesium levels here. So this water, highly radioactive. That's where the radioactivity of the unit two went. Other the other units the radioactivity is less and it went more in the in the atmosphere. <coughs> uh, the the units these actually look classed as as number seven on the IEA scale <coughs> because they did generate quite a lot of radioactivity released to the environment, and so that's why they put them as as, as on the scale of IAEA as 7. Uh, and the, the radioactive release was like 5 to 10 percent of Chernobyl, but you know the area of dispersal is much smaller than in Chernobyl, so the, the uh, cleanup job is almost the same in the area which is affected. In, in, in Chernobyl they did not clean up everything all the areas so uh, and and so this, the the intensity of work is about the same <clears throat> now the japanese government and people do not wish to fence off the affected land and infrastructure a 40-year plan has been formulated to dismantle the four fukushima reactors remove the molten fuel and spent fuel from units one to three and and the and the and the, uh, the spent fuel in the pools. <clears throat> the economic consequences of Fukushima accidents are beyond belief. We are talking about $500 billion there. 
expenses of $500 billion, which I don't think some small country can afford. Yeah, it's just not possible to afford that kind of expense. Now, Japan is a rich country, so but they, even they are suffering in terms of the expense that's involved. This is the 40-year plan. They're going uh, to try to get the uh, fuel and, and, and finish removing fuel in 25 years and, and uh, then in 30 to 40 years finish dismantling reactor buildings. All this is going on at the moment, slowly, slowly, and, and a lot of money is being spent. The impact of these accidents on the LWR safety, that's the second topic on, on, my, second, on my title. Uh, there's no risk of nuclear power until a severe accident happens. Now, I mean this and, and the radioactivity release. And the wake-up call from TMI to accident was that in spite of many years of earnest efforts to prevent a severe accident, such an accident can occur. It was a surprise to U.S. In a, in that, that a accident like severe accident can occur. And they, at that time, we thought that this is not possible. It was in the impossible regime with the probabilities told, uh, calculated, and that it will never happen. <clears throat> so we started a lot of research uh, to look at the, we need, needed a knowledge base, so we started research, but uh, after a while, uh, the U.S. and, and Japan uh, <clears throat> just stopped their research, and now it's continuing in Europe, and also in Korea, and, but uh, the pace is not that rapid. We have some projects, but not too many, and, and not so fast either. So it is, uh, it is going on, but not so well. The other wake-up call from TMI to accident that, that the non-technical aspects of light water reactor safety are almost as important as the technical aspects. This includes safety culture, operator training, emergency procedures, organization, and management, were, and this was beefed up after the, after the TMI2 accident. We had some practical steps implemented in the U.S. and other countries. <coughs> and uh, a technical support teams were instituted and, and, and pursued. TMI2 accident, however, was relatively benign. Nothing much really was affected. The total cost was that the plant was lost, of course, and about 785 million were spent afterwards to, to clean up and bring all the all the material out to Idaho uh, for burial. But uh, uh, and so the nuclear enterprise all over the world did the minimum they had to, except that in Sweden. I will come to that. But in response to the TMI two accident. The wake-up call from Chernobyl was that large-scale environmental and societal damage can occur <coughs> if the containment was absent or failed early in the, during the accident. Uh, and and uh, it was truly, truly a large uh, you know, dispersal of radioactivity from the Chernobyl. But, uh, you know, in the, in the West, we did not really pay too much attention to. I was part of it in the teams in the U.S. We said, oh, RBMK plants are very different from the Western plants. They have serious design flaws. They have positive void coefficient, very slow shutdown systems, and so on. And, and they have common mode failures. And, they, and in this accident, there were successive and, and serious errors. And of course, only 31 people died, so it's not that many, you know, when you think about it. <clears throat> and they also said, we also said, Soviet population are used to high cons consequence accidents and societal upheaval. And, uh, and the, the quoted economic loss was not that high, only 7 billion rubles. Although ruble was more expensive at that time than, 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 a, than the dollar. But, so there was not a great big response it, certainly in USA there was not a big response to, to Chernobyl and we didn't do much research 
concerned with the Chernobyl accident. Uh, <clears throat> now look at the impact of accidents on, on, uh, on the, in Japan, the Fukushima accidents. All the plants have been stopped and, and uh, uh, in the response uh, to the other, this accident in other countries has developed stress tests for all the commercial nuclear plants in Europe. But in USA, the, uh, the, we did all these studies, but not much is being done in response. Not much is being done right now. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, um, administrative measures, management measures have been, but there has not been any, any changes in the plant and the, and, and, and the, and the whole different infrastructures. Uh, now, the, the lessons learned, uh, I, are, this is my view on this uh, impact of accidents on LWR safety. And the first lesson that we should learn is that the public is most upset when they have to leave their homes and possessions and they cannot return readily to their homes again. Uh, for the public, radioactive is a fear complex. They just, uh, they just are very afraid of it and it's unseen. In particular, to move back to their homes, the mothers have to be assured that convinced that the small doses of radioactivity which may experience for long durations will not be a health hazard for their children. This is the most important statement I have here, that, that the people themselves do not want to come back unless they get convinced that, they, that the radioactivity is not going to affect the health of their children. Now, I think the, uh, the published performance, published reports have not rec recognized that the operator performance is very important in, in doing an accident. Very important. What the operator does or does not do really affects the consequences. And, and, and that should be taken into account that an operator can really follow up an accident and make greater radioactive releases or greater consequences. <clears throat> and and, and the, we cannot blame him so much because there's no instrumentation in the plants to track the progression of a severe accident. We really don't have any instrumentation to say, yeah, here is radioactivity in this room and this, this part of the, and here's some hydrogen uh, which we should think about. Uh, we don't really have any, any idea where is the pressure in, in, the, in, the, in the containment so, so well. We just don't have the instrumentation. There was no hydrogen meters in, in Fukushima reactor buildings or, or the, or the, or the uh, you know, fission product measurement. <coughs> and uh, they, they could not be, they did not know what, where the accident is proceeding, where, what's the consequences of the accidents are, what they could do. They, they couldn't do very much, but they're mostly flying blind, yeah. Now, I think uh, no consideration of societal and economic consequences are currently being, uh, they are being addressed now, but there was none initially when the Fukushima accident happened. Uh, we have been paying attention to risk, but only through the probability and not through the consequence. We have been, which means we are trying to prevent accidents all the time. We don't really mitigate the accidents' effects, but we are just always trying to prevent. Uh, the, the, one should think about this, that when the accident is, happened, is happening, that means all your efforts to prevent have failed. At that time, your accident probability is 1.0, not, not 0 0.1 times 10 to minus 5 or 10 to minus 7. It is, at that time, the probability is 1.0 because all you wanted to, uh, all the things you did to prevent the accident have failed at that time. <clears throat> and also, um, as I mentioned earlier, the societal upheaval 
and economic costs are huge. And, and uh, the social upheaval and anxiety is also magnified by unknown dura duration of the loss of habitat, employment, other amenities. For the public, it is very important that they should be, if they are evacuated, they should be back within a week or something so that they are, they are not, uh, you know, put someplace in, in some shelter and, and they can't come back and they just uh, are without homes, without their uh, way of life for months and months and maybe years. <clears throat> now that's what clean up of the ground contaminants is a long, arduous process. It can take months, it can take years, and also there's going to be controversy and disagreement on re-entry conditions. Which can which can you know disturb the populations a lot, <clears throat> and so the societal and economic risks should become part of nuclear power risks. A utility owner of a plant cannot really provide for you know for these these big big accidents. They cannot cover such costs. So this has to be a national uh, treasury which has to be allocated. To, to take care of some of these very heavy costs that can occur. Now I have some other uh, shortcomings which I'm uh, going to talk about. One is the concept of res residual risk. Uh, this is, uh, is, is a concept that we can accept some risks. Some ris risks we cannot completely get rid of, we'll accept those risks. And these are basically for events which uh, we cannot calculate too well. Axe vessel, steam explosion, base met, melt through, containment fuel, timings, and characteristics. Uh, after 24 hours is the provision in, in the current regulation of the USNRC that what comes out after 24 hours is acceptable in a way. It, it is, this is because the containment timing is, is, is fixed as maximum, minimum containment timing if, uh, sh uh, for the containment to be in, intact is 24 hours. After 24 hours it fails, so some radioactivity will come out, but this is in the residual risk. So these res risks are accepted. I think uh, my view is that, that in Fukushima, uh, all, these, uh, all these things that we needed, like uh, uh, a long tall wall and 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 uh, and and, uh, and the other items that they needed to the accident to prevent well to have the valves open and all that they they were very small amount of money compared to what the money we had to spend afterwards so they the 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 consequences of such accidents are too large they cannot be accepted as residual risk so now we do need to tell people that the no generation of electricity can be without some risk, but we also have to tell ourselves that the rare high consequence nuclear accident should not become should not become residual risk. Another thing which uh, we always invoke is the cost benefit and backfit rules, and this is more a criticism of what's being done in in US rather than in Europe. Uh, the, the cost benefit is invoked when backfits or major improvements may be, may be proposed for commercial nuclear power plants. This is not required in Europe, but perhaps in other countries as well. However, always utilities talk about it's going to cost us so much. We, do you really want it? Uh, you know, you have to um, convince them that, yeah, you have to do that. <coughs> Well, that's what I'm coming again saying that the benefits are, are awarded costs. The awarded costs in terms of if, if you have a release in the environment are so high that some of these benefits which uh, we are talking about are, are so high that the cost can be very low compared to those benefits which are the awarded costs. I, uh, I personally believe that cost-benefit rule should not be invoked for severe accidents. Okay, the other um, thing which is important to remember now or to, to
to think about is the safety design base for all commercial LWRs built so far is still the same as it was prescribed 35, 50 years ago. Uh, it, it, it is the same large LOPA and Chapter 15 transients. There is no consideration of, of uh, severe accidents in, in, the, in the design basis. Uh, there are some rules uh, which, have been, uh, which have been put together, uh, anticipate transient without scram rules and station blackout rules and this uh, hydrogen management rules. But these are sort of obliquely that they, they consider them, that these are something which you should take care of this rule, but this is not in the design basis. It's not uh, really in, 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 in a firm uh, way that a, 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 a vendor has to really come back and say, yes, I can take care of all the, all the loads of a severe accident in my plan. <laughs> so, but the, we are lucky in a way that the vendors have responded, uh, that the Gen 3 plans that are coming in, 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 in the new, new, new construction, Gen 3 plants, they have core catchers. Core catchers are important that they uh, keep this uh, melt inside and, and not uh, and try to prevent any release of, of uh, radioactivity to the environment. But we have not put that, still the, the severe accident is not a design base even for the Gen 3 plants. And, and, uh, and there may be some vulnerabilities, but we have not really uh, gone over that so much. And I come back to this instrumentation again, that there's no practical no instrumentation to track a severe accidents. I know it is difficult to qualify this instrumentation for the severe accident conditions, but you have to have instrumentation for the for the operator as well as the as well as the accident support team to know and, and because the accidents are taking a long time they they went in in Fukushima went on for three days four days and and during that time decisions had to be taken and and we did not have any instrumentation to tell what really is happened uh, what really is happening in in the plant during that time. Uh, I also want to point out that stabilization and termination of a severe accident, which is very important, is very hard to do. Uh, the basic problem is once the, once the temperatures, uh, fuel clearing reaches zirconium oxidation temperature, then the accident is going to happen. Most probably it's very difficult to avoid that. Uh, because, and then the timing is short. It's, it takes only about two hours if you, want to supply, if you have no water supply for the water to boil off and get into the temperatures for the fuel where the zirconium oxidation can start. And once it starts, it, it, it really brings in a lot more heat and, and, uh, and within the next two, three hours, a core can melt. And a core melt protects itself from rapid cooling with water by forming an insulating crust. As we saw in TMI2, that there was a melt in, inside a, a insulating crust and it didn't cool down. It, we had full, the vessel full of water, but it, it did not cool down and some of it came down into, into, the, into the vessel bottom. Uh, and then if well comes into the dry containments of wet water reactors, then it can attack concrete to produce non-condensable gases, which can pressurize the containment to failure. Providing water on top of melt may not assure quenching of melt. We have not been able to prove that yet. I was in charge of many experiments on that, and, and so we have to deal with that that the melt has to be cooled, and, and if it doesn't cool, then it attacks the base mat, and it can go through the base mat in one to four days. So this is not an easy thing to deal with in, 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 in terms of measures that you can uh, uh, institute in, in a severe accident. Now, this is a situation with Gen 2 plants. 
Gen 2 plants, but they are the majority of the plants. They are the majority. Gen 3 plants only are coming in now, and, and they are, uh, we are lucky that they have provided this stabilization and termination of accidents. They at least have measures to do that. <clears throat> now, what should be the safety goals for commercial nuclear power? Uh, I think the Fukushima accidents have demonstrated it will be beneficial for nuclear power to also adopt the goals of no long-term evacuation of residents nearby. This actually is in the, in the European, uh, um, uh, this, uh, what is this called, the uh, EURs, the European Utility Requirements. No large release of radioactivity to the environment, no basement melt through, no land contamination beyond the nuclear plant boundary. If, the, if you adopt that, then, then we can eliminate the societal and economic damage of a severe accident in a commercial. And strong containments which can withstand without failure and additional leakage, some beyond design-based external inter internal loads, for example, earthquake, tornado, airplane crash, and conservatively evaluated steam explosions, hydrogen detonations, gas pressurization. There's all all these can occur in a severe accident. So, uh, in terms of conclusions, we believe that safe nuclear plant should have systems to both prevent and mitigate consequences of a severe accident, stabilize and terminate a severe accident rapidly, provide a filtered vent system to manage early or late releases if needed, provide hydrogen control systems in all buildings, provide qualified instrumentation to track a severe accident. And currently, pro concurrently programs be started to educate the public that electricity is not risk-free. We have to have some risk. It's always said some risk associated with electricity generation. I, with hydrocarbon burning as long, distinct long-term health and environmental damage consequences and, and, and also we should educate the public that low dose radioactivity may not have drastic health effects for all ages. Epidemiological studies should be started in this respect to demonstrate that. And, and you know that people living in Denver, for example, they, are, they get more radioactivity than, than the people who live in San Francisco. So in that sense, there is a large population who's tolerating some higher radioactivity and they live happily, there's no, no problem there, but you have to convince the public that these are measurements, that we have done this epidemiological study for 40 years and, and that the number of people in the, in the studies, like large number, like 200,000 people. So that kind of studies have to be done. Now I come to this is the happy situation somewhat. Response of Sweden to the Fukushima accident for reactor safety performance. And, and the first is a little description of the EU test, test process. And uh, it's our uh, Swedish response is in the context of the stress test process mandated by EU. And actually, the EU Council reacted very strongly to the, Europe, to the Fukushima accidents. Knowing full well the density of populations that is larger in Europe than in the US, for example, is, is more than 150 reactors. So there's a large population of reactors and a large number of people who can be exposed to it. So they requested the uh, and CERC, the Nuclear Safety Regulators Group, to immediately organize a review of all nuclear plants on the basis of comprehensive transparent risk and safety assessments. So these tests, tests were conducted uh, by national regulators and uh, who prepared the national reports. Uh, and the focus was on natural external events of concern, earthquakes and and tsunamis and ice storm, for example, in Sweden, loss of safety systems, severe accident management, and later it was expanded in even into design issues, uh, organizational issues, emergency preparedness, international cooperation. 
Now here uh, I'm going to talk about the NPP improvements in Sweden before Fukushima accidents. And this is a happy story. It, that it should be recognized that Sweden has been very diligent in improving the safety of the NPPs be, much before the occurrence of this Fukushima accident. This is basically uh, the, the response to TMI2 and to Chernobyl accidents. It, it recognize, we recognize that indeed uh, if you release a uh, large release of greater than 1% of cesium content will call, cause land contamination which would require evacuation of residents more than 20 kilometers from the NPP. This will put on land usage restrictions. So the regulatory authorities here, which is in, the, in before was SKI, now it's SSM, uh, have, have limited that the release of cesium be limited to 150 terabacarols, uh, which could be tolerable to the populations. And there was a cost-benefit uh, assessment then, and that led to the uh, recommendation that, that filters on vents from the containment be provided. And, and, and the filters they chose, which was um, uh, based on the test which uh, I was involved with also when I was in EPRI, uh, the LACE experiments, and this was the multi-venturi kind, which had a TF uh, uh, decontamination factor of up to 4,000. And they also provided that a 24-hour total station blackout be the design basis for this, this kind of evaluation. And uh, no single failure in BWR pressure suppression function. We are mostly BWRs, and so this was uh, that the, the pressure relief should not need operator action if containment integrity is threatened. These decisions were done in, in 81, which was after the TMI2, and in 1986, which was after the Chernobyl accident. So the Venturi filters were installed in 10 plants by 1998. The two plants, which the Barsebeck, uh, near Copenhagen, they were actually a, another containment was provided for, for filled with stones, pebbles to to retain any 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 radioactive release that could have that could have occurred in an accident. And and they also prescribed that a safe, stable state be achieved for the degraded core without undue delay, and that for that. We put to put a water pool under the core, under the vessel, which would be nine to twelve meters deep, and and was uh, uh, was it was assumed that no high conversion ratio steam explosion would occur. And and uh, uh, there was also uh, idea of putting water level all the way up to to the to the uh, vessel. But that needed a, a, a venting, and also uh, also was concerned that the steam explosion could be large if the, if the vessel failed, and 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 uh, <coughs> it was commendable that the Swedish regulatory authority SKI at that time considered the issue of large release from BWR early in the reactor safety game from a societal and economic damage viewpoint which was not done in the United States and probably not in Germany either and some of the other countries as well because all the country, many, many countries just followed U.S. example and, and took the regulations from the U.S. Now, about the releases, uh, we want to compare what the releases were compared to what the, the stipulation of 150 Tucker uh, terabel, uh, no, uh, <coughs> terabacarel. The release from uh, Chernobyl was 1,800,000 terabacarel of CC and 85,000 terabacarel uh, 85, of cesium and 1,800,000 terabacarel of, of iodine 
out of which approximately 4,000 terabacarel of cesium-137 came to Sweden. And the numbers are here. The area is contaminated at greater than one curie per kilometer square. For Sweden, it was 12,000 kilometers. And for, of course, Russian Federation, Belarus. But even for Italy, it was 300 square kilometers. So this is the, <coughs> and the, the consequences of and, and but um, that it should be mentioned, Sweden is a long way from uh, Chernobyl, 2,008 kilometers. But there was no no additional equipment or measures provided in the plans, except the completion of programs already started. Filter vented, vented work was completed on 10 plants in 1998. Programs were started on human factors interface between man and technology and organizations, feedback from operating experience, a periodic safety assessment of existing plants, including detailed plant-specific PSAs. But this is the radioactivity which got deposited in Sweden, and, and you see that here, and uh, there's some areas where it was uh, little pillow, uh, about 20 to uh, more than a hundred uh, terabacarel uh, per meter square, and that was uh, right where these blue areas are. And, and, and on the right side, you see the whole map of Europe and where the radioactivity from Chernobyl went, and, uh, and mostly it's deposited, but some in Finland also a lot of radioactivity, and then some of it went to the to the other countries on the south side too. So the action plan is is uh, is to rely on the already installed systems after T after the TMI two accident. Uh, there is, however, several maze of modernization and safety upgrading that are being performed. These include the following measures, and these are measures which I guess SSM knows about, and they have already actually ask the plants to do those. But I have some personal observations. That a nuclear accident of any magnitude, even 150 terabacarel, is a societal and economic disaster. Since the population are scared of radioactivity of any magnitude, any another accident of a large release would be would evoke strong public reactions which can shut down all nuclear activities in the world. In spite of the fact that people evacuation with the people evacuation risk for fatalities would be as low as incurred in the Fukushima accidents. No, nobody died in Fukushima. You know, there was <coughs> uh, the response of Sweden and other Euro European countries is comprehensive in a conventional sense. However, it appears that all stakeholders have shut, shut away from backfits. Nobody wants to do any backfits. Really. And the, the, the PWR plants of Fukushima type in USA have been avoiding commitment to filtered vents even. The plants in Europe have acted responsibly to install the filtered vents on most, con most containments, upgrade the safety of plants to the extent there may not be an immediate large release of radio radioactivity. And, but the plants which are being upgraded are Gen 2 plants, which do not have containments which can assure complete coolability of a coal melt to stabilize and terminate the exit. There's the, still the hazard of basement melt through to ground contamination, radioactive water, etc. The cleanup of the plant and environmental co contamination is a terrible consequence which can last for a, a lot of years. Um, to assure melt coolability in Gen, Gen 2 plants, more research into backfits would, backfits would be helpful. Uh, another action missing in action plan of Sweden, as well as those of all other countries in the world, is the provision of instrumentation the plant and defined for the operator and the support supporting technical organization. The start and the progression of severe accident in the plant. 
It requires instrumentation at several locations in the plant system of thermocouples, hydrogen meters, fission product radioactivity sensors. The provision of such instrumentation would have helped the operators in Fukushima to gauge the extent of the hazard and the progression of the accident. So I think this is a good idea to do that. And uh, uh, certainly the installation of thermocouples on a vessel wall is not a difficult backfit, although the probability is high that the high radiation field will have to be dealt with. Uh, the utility staff could determine the most advantageous location of instrumentation after some analysis. So that's all I had to say, and uh, I hope you understood some of my personal comments. And, and uh, this is a mixture of the history and a mixture of uh, you know what happened recently, but certainly in Fukushima and this impact on, on the nuclear power uh, situation and, and uh, some personal comments after that on, on possible things to do or possible way to think about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you about is that you, you, you know we speak to NRC, we speak to the commissioners on this part. What's your interpretation? What do they say to your comments in this respect? I mean, you are in many organizations in US. Uh, we might not see the same statements that you, you provide to us. Thank you for asking. I, I can only say that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is uh, affected by the politics in the in U.S. There's a strong industry organization and, uh, uh, and, and the Congress supports that organization. And the Congress is the boss for regulatory also, yeah. They don't report to the president, they, they report to Congress, yeah. And do you believe that we should consider new methods to estimate risk at uh, nuclear power plants? Pardon me? I didn't understand that. New methods, you mentioned that the probabilities were uh, um, had, had large uncertainties, and that you should focus on consequences. Yeah. But prevention as well as mitigation. Yeah. Consequences are very important. And consequences are important for public very much. You know, they are. Uh, the public is afraid of radioactivity. A, a release from the plant should be avoided at all costs. Yeah. Do you think that one should update the wash? What, what, wash finding? Yeah. It, it was updated uh, in uh, New York 1150, it was called. And that was done much later. And uh, they came to the same conclusions almost as, as the watch for tomorrow. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we leave you <laughs> with this. Okay, Kader. Uh, I'm Carl Berile, Vattenfall. Uh, imagine there would be a, uh, another severe accident in, in the near future. You will hope not, it will not happen, but imagine, what would be the impact, do you think, for the nuclear industry on a global scale? <laughs> I, I would 
say, yeah, I, I, I'm really in, in a very good, I, I support very much nuclear power plants for baseball generation. We need them for that. We really do need nuclear plants for baseball generation. And I think it, we should have a mix of all different types of, uh, you know, plant types. Uh, renewables as well, and and uh, that is, uh, and we may have to ge uh, design or keep working on batteries or or storage <coughs> energy storage systems. But uh, I think we should have a combination of all of these. But for for the for the for the base load, when people need the power all the time, the, not only during the day. And we should have nuclear plants, and uh, I support them. But we should really. The problem right now, I think, nuclear industry faces more than anything else is the cost. The cost of plants has gone up so much in terms of. I remember about 20 years before I came to Sweden, in one of the ANS meetings, a plea was made that we have to reduce the cost of nuclear power to one thousand dollars per kilowatt. Right now we train about five thousand dollars per kilowatt. And that is the problem. That really is the problem even for base load generation, that it is hard to compete with the other systems, you know. And uh, we have to bring up the safety and reduce the and, and this is not an easy thing to do, <laughs> but this is the message that we, if we want to survive, want the nuclear power to survive, and and we for long term, uh, that's what we have to do. We, I think, the Gen three plants have really up the safety of the nuclear power plants, but uh, there's still maybe some more to do, but. Uh, but the costs have to go down. Yes, I, I would echo what has been said. Thank you for an excellent presentation. And, and I would like to catch up where you, where you stopped right now. And, and that is uh, what I can feel or, or what I see around the world now is that we are new countries that want to embark nuclear, and then the old uh, nuclear countries are reluctant to continue with, with nuclear. And, and uh, what I am afraid of is that we will go back to building Gen 2 gen, uh, reactors due to the cost factor of, of Gen 3, 3 reactors and, 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 uh, and uh, with the lack of this new safety uh, modernization work that have been going on in the, in the mature nuclear countries. For example, I have been uh, asked by a representative from Mali, from Kenya, from Egypt. Uh, we have the projects in Vietnam. Uh, I will in May go to Belarus to see their new project where they are building two new uh, reactors. And, and how do you uh, reflect on the situation, the regulators, the society and the vendors who desperately need to sell their products. Thank yeah, you. I, for example, I would say I have advised the Indian government to go to Gen 3 plants only, not to Gen 2. And, uh, and uh, even the plants in, uh, which have been built now in, in, uh, in uh, this uh, emigrants, emigrants. I've been critical of them that they have, they are still gentle plants. They have a, uh, they have a uh, investment retention provided there, but the power is too high. From my point of view, it's just at the very edge. And uh, they probably could operate them at 1,000 megawatts and that'd be okay, yeah. But uh, this kind of, uh, they probably would not, and that's the thing. They probably would. So that kind of thing. I think it's important to stipulate from our point of view, from the more advanced countries' point of view, that 
tell people that you are building this in a high density, population density areas, you should think about your people. Think about your people. Of course, every 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 plant owner is praying to God that, that nothing happens to their plant because it's a probability argument, you know, after all. And, but uh, if it happens, then it will be not good at all. But, so, Okay, a step back to a quest, uh, technical question after some, some very interesting uh, more political questions. Thank you for, for an excellent uh, presentation, uh, confirmed by what I've heard before about your way of giving very good presentations. Um, I was wondering about um, your personal, or say, based on your research, uh, your feeling about one question which you touched on here. Uh, one of, an important um, severe accident measure in Sweden is the uh, water filling of the lower dry well. Uh, so after melt ejection we can get a coolable uh, debris bed. And you said that uh, we cannot preclude um, ex vessel steam explosions that are bad enough to damage the, the uh, containment. Um, what's your, I would say, the, could you comment on your feeling for what are the uh, uncertainties and what's your feeling for this general issue? It's very high uncertainty. I think that's the problem with steam explosions. It's a very complex phenomenon. And uh, we have courts written and uh, we are actually doing experiments in, in, uh, in, in PTH on, on uh, the fundamental nature of steam explosion and how, it, how does it trigger and all that. But uh, I would say that our containments, PWR containments in Gen 2 plants, are not strong enough to take a high uh, energy. I, I, long time ago, I think SKI did a, a study on the uh, under kilopascal second action and found that the that the uh, walls can move a meter or two feet or something like that. So that that kind of uh, you need a strong containment for containing a high energy state. And, and uh, maybe we will not have one such high energy explosion, but we have not been able to exclude it yet. Yeah. That's what I think. I cannot say that it will not occur. Yeah. We, and recently we also found some another uh, explosion uh, possibility, which is water. Uh, uh, met spreading under under water. That while in the spreading process, it generates instabilities, which can lead to a, a explosion, which we cannot exclude. Uh, Jack Valentin, formerly of ICRP, thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is simple. Uh, you didn't include uh, wind scale, and I thought uh, the wind scale accident is similar in consequences to Fukushima and would have made a difference to the probability uh, argument. And uh, the second question is more in line with what Frederick brought up. Uh, you've been talking a lot about backfit and the problems they're having in the United States. Uh, because companies would like not to invest that much because in the short term it, it costs a lot and the long term perspective doesn't make, make any impact in, in uh, boardrooms. Uh, however, isn't that a vicious circle? Shouldn't one, instead of going for backfits, try to go for small modular reactors and other newer designs? Well, 
I, I think the wind scale issue was, I exclude that because that was graphite, uh, cooled air, air cooled reactants, which are not, uh, I, my title was like LWRs, yeah. So I did not include that. But coming back to your uh, <clears throat> question of moving to a new reactor type, Again, I think it's cost issue. It's small SMR, uh, it's like 100 megawatt to at the most 200 megawatt plant. And, 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 and to make it uh, safe, really truly safer, uh, they have even uh, decided in one design, which was BMW design, to put it underground and that is expensive. It, it is mainly the expense issue uh, because nobody, the design was almost complete and, and uh, was being uh, proposed by the vendor in Babcock Wilcox, but nobody bought it. So they are shutting down their operation. And there's another one which is only 50 megawatt in US and uh, and they are also <laughs> struggling to sell it. Uh, they have not been able to sell it. Uh, I think it's a market issue. Uh, that's why I come to come back. I think the, uh, a large nuclear plant, which is not overly large, but it is within the bounds of design, as a base loaded plant. I think that's a good. Uh, that's a good thing. Why not? It works 24 hours a day and works for a year without any refueling and, and it keeps generating so much power and if it lasts 60 years then maybe you can tell that indeed it is economic. But the initial cost is so high that nobody is really buying it this easily. I think the Chinese effort is, is, is all centrally directed and they seem to have a lot of money. So, I mean, they somehow have a lot of money by selling all these all these toys and other things to the world. They have plenty of money, yeah. Okay, thank you. More comments? No? Okay, I think we... Thank you a lot for this interesting... <laughs> Good luck, future. Thank you.